When you're ready. Franklin Delano Roosevelt made famous the phrase, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In his inaugural address, FDR was coaching the American people, explaining that fear was impacting the decisions, choices, and behavior. Powerful when put into words, but difficult to put into motion. Whether humans believe it or not, fear is always possible. It is brought on by specific causes and situations that vary by individual. For some, it might be heights that cause it. To others, spiders. Regardless of the source, the fight or flight response is an automatic physiological reaction to whatever is perceived as stressful or frightening. For centuries, creators of stories and entertainment have explored, molded, and tapped into the ingrained human response. Stretching back to Mary Shelley and her 1818 novel Frankenstein, to Jordan Peele's modern day catalog of horror films, delving and expanding into what provokes fear and retreat has become omnipresent in creative narratives. In these stories, often, the fight or flight response is characterized by rash decisions that seem ridiculous and, because of it, are mocked or criticized by the reader or audience. From suddenly forgetting how to run to deciding to hide in a mass murderer shed filled with chainsaws, characters seem to put themselves into harm's way intentionally. With this in mind, does high emotion driven by fear result in cognitive chaos? And are the constant miscalculated actions of characters in horror narratives manufactured plot transitions or accurate representations of decisions made in response to high amounts of stress? Enabled by virtual reality technology, the study immersed subjects into apprehensive decision-making storylines and through the interpretation of qualitative and quantitative observations of human responses when confronted by fear provides an understanding of the validity of choices made by characters in horror films, which ultimately will help determine if the behaviors are representative of overwhelming fear causing us to make rash decisions. Research on the horror genre has grown substantially, asking and answering questions such as why people seek it out, like to be scared, and fears short and long-term impacts. That said, most investigation associated with, associated with fear is focused on the neurological and physical implications. What is yet to be investigated is how people would spontaneously act if faced with a situation that's perceived in even the most ridiculous of horror films. Audience members scoff at a character's seemingly stupid actions, but only because they are just that, audience members, who are privy to all kinds of information that the characters don't know. In his study, The Biology of Fear, Ralph Adoffs, professor of psychology, neuroscience, and biology at the California Institute of Technology, outlines some of the gaps in reaction-based fear research. He says, despite an explosion of recent findings spurred in large part by of, uh, by large part by funding to help understand mood and anxiety disorders, the field of emotion research is more fragmented than ever. A flurry, a flurry of neurological data has, become, has, has come from two technological developments, fMRI, which is applied to humans, and optogenetics, which is applied to mice. Yet findings from these two approaches and ecological, in addition to psychological work, have not resulted in any consequences and any consensus on op op operationalizing or investigating the emotion of fear. From what scientists have concluded, there are two main reactions for fear, fight or flight. Gina Wen alludes, this part, the part of your brain that responds to emotions, the amygdala, sends a stress signal to the hypothalamus, the command center, the automatic nervous system. So yes, there are connections to neurological decision making, yet the reasoning lack of yet the reasoning lacks deviation of results. Not everyone reacts the same to separate situations and sites of panic. So does fight or flight indulge in the what could be? One of the most apparent reasons society draws to the horror genre is the rush of stimulation it provides. As Yang and Zhang explain, watching horror movies simultaneously activates positive and negative forms of stimulation changing the biochemistry inside our bodies when experiencing fear. Another approach, as psychologist Glenn D. Walters explains, is that what horror films include in their plots are elements viewers identify with, such as themes of psychological fear, death, and even the unknown social issues and cultural importance. To a massive extent, if not most, of the decisions made in horror films and media, media are certainly not the most logical examples. But with the great strides in technology over the past decade, devices only imagined in science fiction are now on the market today. One source of transferable automation is the new and improved generations of virtual technology. Compared to an actual movie set, 
Vera stimulates the senses inside the brain to continuously make the most, ev mostly everything feel real. So where does this lead? Instilling and enacting true versatile fear is not a simple task. Early in the process, I considered discussing films known for and generally criticized as illogical, having plots where characters' choices are not the best. I determined that the immersive results this research required for optimized for optimum results could not be achieved merely by watching a film. Through extensive research to select games with plot lines that could create scenarios that parallel the unrealistic plots in films, three titles were chosen: Five Nights at Freddy's, Jurassic World Aftermath, and Face Your Fears. 21 subjects were recruited for the study. While some, were, so while some originally expressed their interest in research, most signed up through Google Forms. With a wide range of developed surveys and quizzes, I formatted my own background research, information, possible warnings, consent documents, and time slots for availability. Activating, after re receiving responses, I replied to each volunteer to schedule a trial. I incorporated the basic setup of a VR device and a tripod, along with this spacious setting. To oversee the collected data in a fluid and simplified manner, double perspective video documentation was taken for qualitative evaluation. The structure follows in what is both seen in-game by the volunteer and physically by the observer slash input collector. Without a play-by-play -play of either look, outlook, the emotional component of what made what happen is conflicted, and the purpose of the data is disorganized. Participants progressed average and maximal heart rate was also recorded to ensure the focal point and capture the quantity of data. Initially, the exercise rate heart rate monitor pro by Logger Pro was planned to be the responsible for this portion of research. However, the device was planned, the, the device operated unpredictably, starting and stopping with the slightest bit of sensitivity. With this realization, the option of Fitbit technology ensured that a much more suitable support system for this type of research calculated. Paired with the cellular application VeriFit Pro, the two provided a structured method to, graf to graphically capture a user's BPM and its fluctuations throughout the process. That being said, virtual reality technology could be better. It's reassuring for participants to know that they could, with an upwards gesture, take off the device. Asking, can I be done now? And stopping the gameplay puts a pin on ensuring, ensuing complete terror. This isn't to say that the goal of the study is to scare subjects to a point of extreme distress. Some may argue that this, that the, this project is based on immeasurable standards, as movies are movies and games are games. Even with solid information, what's achieved here through research can always be deemed as inaccurate. Unfortunately, building a haunted house for the sake of research wasn't attainable at the scale. Universal Studios may have the ability and budget to do so, but this research initiative does not. However, as long as enough research and evidence is presented, pressing similarities and among participants along the way, a solid argument can be made and upheld. Out of the three VR games used, Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted yielded the most profound statistics. With each VM placed on record, players' vitals were compared to their behaviors, considering that a normal rusty heart rate ranges from 60 to 100. After the evaluations were completed, the highest BPM was 158, with the lowest being 63. The game elicited the highest average BPM across participants and players. Like many horror films, the game relies heavy on its jump scares, with the task to survive the night as paranormal animatronics roam a very low sanitary family diner. To return for another ship, the player must keep an eye on their power supply, all while monitoring the security cameras as the demonic mascots stalk their movements. But like fear, human curiosity is an instinct that is hard to control. New surroundings, typically seen as uncomfortable or unnerving, are attempted to be recognized in whatever way, shape, or form in order to familiarize them. Not knowing what will keep them alive, the participant instinctively activates and generates an offensive, defensive, and observational reply to the situation. Even when truly afraid, with a heightened BPM, they can appear calm or intense, focused or even threatened. Unlike Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted, Face Your Fears 2 incorporates the real world mechanism into the study. More specifically, the game panders to the, panders to the choose your own component, one unused in Help Wanted. Of the data collected, the free range capabilities implemented a massive effect to players opening up to exploring and moving around what they encountered. In three specific categories, Behaviors range from remaining vigilant and focused, 
yet curious, immersing themselves into their environment, more observant, and timid and cautious, a grab-and-go kind of pattern. From data collected from participants, face shifters to allow players, even with the necessity to progress in the game, to sit and question, why would I do this? For the example, at the, moment, at the beginning of the game, participants are given the choice to pick up a fallen phone while driving. The logic of the depicted real-life scenario invokes the question of what the volunteer focuses on all above else. If they choose to grab the phone, a ghostly specter appears in front of them, in front of the car window, causing them to crash. Blood is a vital action needed to progress in the game. Out of the volunteers, more than half of them questioned the decision before actually making it. In Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted, requests for assistance appeared at the same moments amongst all subjects who played them. For those who played Face Shifters 2, they emerged in largely unique, unique and personalized instances. This, when connected to BPM data, provides a better understanding of why this occurs. This, for example, one subject, participant 13, was steadfast in experiencing the trial without asking for any assistance. Though she encountered one specific situation where she initially didn't realize the slight threat at hand. While searching for a newly discovered backpack, a time jump scare involving a snake leaves them to decide how they should scare it away. Participant 3 didn't notice this until the audible cues for the creature were all too real, causing her to start again. Her average heart rate was around 83, with a height of 114. Participant 8 remained casual, however frequently asked what he was and should be doing. During the instance with the snake, he recoiled with the reptile, but returned with a, I actually like snakes. From the trial, his average BPM was 83, with his highest recorded statistic being 106. Participant 4, because of her high, high BPM, which was around 169 in her first round, it was decided to have her play the game once again to ensure her statistics were viable. Her reactions did remain similar, though her vitals varied significantly. While playing her first round, she faced a full-bodied apparition and immediately threw the headset off her head, a right reaction explaining her average BPM of 139. However, after her second round, she was much more relaxed, still tense, but better accustomed to her surroundings. After she concluded, participant 4's average was 78, while her highest BPM calculated was around 126. The key takeaway from this proportion of research is the irrational behaviors is directly correlated with the highest recorded BPMs. With repeated exposure to the fear-generating content, BPM, BPM and rationality become inversely correlated, supporting to the theory that fear and rash behavior is directly connected. But interestingly enough, there are other key indicators of behavior that not much fear can cue in response to participants, but also support the irrational behavior in the fear and research in question. Often, characters in horror films, specifically teenage ones, when faced with malevolent forces, respond with defense mechanisms, mainly insults directed at the cause of fear, both anger-based and humor-based. Throughout the tests, many players found themselves conversing with the villainous figures, whether nervously, humorously, or just plain swearing. Though, through heart rate and behavioral data, the player who swore the most had the highest BPM, though the small talk and light commentary approach came in second. The key takeaway from this proportion of the research finds that, for some, a high BPM is correlated to a fear-based defense mechanism to both interact with what is causing fear in order to counter what is typically associated with fear. In addition, to flight-based responses observed in the first game resulting in more fight-based reactions like sarcasm, humor, and even investigation, these fight-based responses are similar to mocked behaviors in horror films. The final game used in the research was Jurassic World Aftermath, a similarly structured survival game that is similarly based on the Jurassic World franchise. This game creates a system of joint, trope, joint, joint tropes related to those made in films that can help connect and compare situations in the game itself. While the characters and plot are significantly separate, some of the choices made both in-game and films bear corresponding and contrasting elements. For spe for spe more specifically, the reality is that, unlike the movies, going off the path is a possibility. An additional puzzle-solving element of the game adds another factor to the player's behavior, similar to Face Your Fears 2, adding a some plot, subplot, or additional stressor to gameplay. While some games such as Five Nights at Freddy's involve manual mechanics, Jurassic World Aftermath further implements 
this stress-inducing design, cross-referencing this with BPM data, differences were present. For one, the player with the most exaggerated reaction had a calculated average heart rate of, one eight, of 84, with her highest reaching 102, whereas another player, who had a less visibly scared stance, had an average of 117, and his highest calculated BPM was 150. Ultimately, when correlated to horror film plots, this data helps indicate that subplots that create additional layers of stress to the scene at hand add to the ability to make and rationalize the result for the rash decisions made by the characters. While the research conducted provides some evidence, both qualitative and quantitative, both qualitative and quantitative, the fear causes people to make rash decisions, and thus the decisions made by characters in horror films are more realistic than they appear. The results presented too much variability across participants in order to be truly conclusive. Ultimately, the data collected identified ultimately the data collected identified additional questions and next steps in order to for the study to continue its purpose. First, is the subject matter or scenario that sparks universal fear, a fear that's spread across all different participants? As said before, the goal of this study wasn't to scare people into extreme distress, or even putting participants in dangerous situations, even virtually, to augment an accurate claim for physiological data can be defined as dangerous, unethical, or immoral. But also identified earlier, fear can vary from person to person. Second, when using highly immersive technology like virtual reality, how can fear be presented authentically and realistically enough to be elicit true, accurate reactions of behavior without physically being, present, being presented by fears, knowing this is only a game, having the ability to remove the VR headset and end the session, amongst other things, make this in, sense, in a sense impossible. Third, unfortunately, with this, um, unfortunately, with this technology and approach, multiple data sets from the sub same subject complicate the data. For example, the highest BPM recorded had a significantly low heart rate after finishing the second trial of the same game. The first exposure to the stimulus is the single opportunity to measure fear and its response. In order to statistically find significant data, the total subject pool would have to be much larger and only include single exposures to the stimulus. And finally, is there a narrow, def narrow definition of rash behavior? From what was collected and analyzed, the choices made by each participant in the gameplay were too unique, too unique to determine one common definition of rash. The observations in this work does have the possibility to both affect the field of psychology and Hollywood box office revenue, though. Virtual reality presents a new way to create immersive scenarios that can provide researchers with a, with a much richer tool for psychological testing. Similarly, VR is an excellent way to inform Hollywood's storylines and scripts. Before going into expensive production, VR can efficiently be used to validate audiences' responses to adapt plots, characterizations, castings, design, etc. The final question to answer, are character reactions in horror movies realistic? The research actually points to yes, but maybe not to everyone. Humans have a very different stimuli when, response to, when responding to fear, whether Hollywood produced or not. Universal fear is dif difficult to establish across all audiences, which means that if fears and behaviors aren't realistic as to one person, they very much well be to another. That said, whether it be spiders, heights, or see-through specters, fear will continue to remain an ingrained response in our behavior and biology and feed the plots of films for decades to come. Um, how did the choices you made when designing your research method impact the process? I really wanted a strategic yet very formulaic system uh, for my data collecting process. This really needed to be constant and non-complex enough in order to be studied quickly and could be compared with other trials. Ultimately, this really helped to bring together what was needed for my final conclusion, or in this case, an authentic array of reactions. Okay, thank you. Um, how did the limitations of your method influence your understanding? Well, the limitations of my method really, in all honesty, base, just influence my, rep, my understanding because unlike films, you really can't replicate true fear, as I said before. At the very least, not without placing victims in very unethical situations. 
more fearful situations are when more narrowly expected to them, and that's really what makes them real. Just experiencing something for the first time, you can't really generate that reaction once again for the second time, as shown again when I had one of my participants go twice since her BPM was super high, but really it was more authentic and necessary for me to find and record those first reactions, which is ultimately what brought my research together. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. Um, if you could revisit your research process, what would, you, what would you do differently and why? Definitely I would have scheduled and found a better way to flow and formulate how I found students. A lot of them either both talked to me and I talked to them to be Google Forms, but I think that having a very well-placed schedule for specific times and amount of games I would play or subjects would play each day would help with probably getting much more research and maybe even in the end I would have a much more well-rounded um, conclusion. Okay, thank you.